Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about human rights and government policy. Welcome back, everyone, to Policy and Rights. I am your host, Michael Cloggs, and we're going to talk today about things that are happening around the world that actually hinder healthcare efforts. They hinder um, doctors around the world to be able to heal and help make people healthy again. Some of those things, of course, are um, war. We still have an ongoing uh, uh, pandemic that stops doctors from being able to get into uh, certain areas because of other health concerns. Um, And then we have one that may not always seem as obvious as it is because in the countries that we live in, if you're currently listening, um, in the U.S. and Canada, certain products are blocked from being able to sell. They're blocked from or restricted from... um, being able to advertise in certain ways or um, you have to present some sort of identification that shows that you are within an eligible age range to purchase certain products. So let, let's first uh, first talk, talk about the pandemic. Um, the the pandemic, of course, um, we have different variants that are traveling ar- around the world at this point. The most of, uh, of of concern is, of course, the Delta variant, and there there's still expressed concerns about how it can break through the barriers of immunization caused by the, the, the vaccines that have been developed. And it, it's still a very much so of concern. It has um, caused uh, several cases here in Canada in the U.S. Um, but for areas like the Caribbean and the and in South America where the pandemic is far from over that um, maybe only 20% of, of the populations in certain countries in those particular areas have actually received even maybe the first dose of vaccine because of problems with shipments problems with um, being able to get the vaccine into into the countries, even, even as such as uh, COVAX supplies being low or hindered. So, it has an effect on other things, such as supplies for things as simple as what we would think would be simple uh, in in Canada or the United States, maybe in in the U uh, the UK. Uh, France or Germany, insulin is easily found. There are countries where that's not the case. And if there's already a hindrance in supply during the best of times, during the pandemic, there can be some serious, serious problems that affect things like heart disease, high blood pressure, that uh, with it, um, s- simple uh, infections just such as getting a cut on the bottom of your foot could cause your foot to have gangrene and then need the need for amputation or sepsis that um, an infection spreads throughout your bloodstream. 
and if the area is already bound up, the hospital is bound up because of COVID-19 and its variants, treatment to, to people with diabetes can be slow and may not come. The same thing goes with, uh, again, it's something that we in more developed countries don't really think about too much hepatitis C, tuberculosis. We can go down the list of simple things that we don't think anything of because, hey, you check in with your doctor and he prescribes um, a couple medications. You shoot over to the pharmacist who's maybe another five minute drive away from the doctor. Notice I said drive not walk because we probably would drive. And you have you have your medication, you go home, you take a you take a couple of pills and you're on your way to being healed. Probably sounds very familiar to a lot of us, right? And in more developed countries, we're closer to 80% of our populations being vaccinated. Then the developed countries are struggling, underdeveloped countries are struggling just to get to 20%. This can be a serious problem for countries in South America, the Caribbean, and even in areas like in Africa. So, we're going to hear uh, from Dr. Etienne uh, from uh, the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO, speak about that. Then, we're going to hear... So we're going to hear from the UN Security Council about what is happening in Myanmar. There has been revolution, and it's been an ongoing thing with Myanmar for quite some time. And we're going to hear a little bit about, in a segment, about the history of revolution and uprising and democracy in the country of Myanmar. We're going to hear more about that. But there are hindrances because of outbreaks of fighting, um, shootings, things like that, hindrance to humanitarian efforts, which mostly concern us with health care. Getting medication and medical treatments in to countries that are fighting, they're fighting for, for, their, for their rights to vote, they're fighting for the, the just for just to have some of the basic things that of clean water and to be able to grow crops so they can feed themselves is what they're fighting for just some of the things that they're fighting for and when the fighting is happening it's hard for healthcare workers doctors and nurses to get to the people who have again the the simple health conditions that we would think are simple health conditions such as diabetes hepatitis tuberculosis even something as simple with a child having food poisoning can have a traumatic effect and maybe even cause death so we're going to listen to what the way the conditions are in Myanmar with the ongoing um, freedom fight and revolution from the the UN Security Council as they are trying to help people be able to have their their version of democracy their version of freedom then we're going to talk about tobacco tobacco in the US and Canada 
has been successfully curbed back. That the campaigns to stop people from smoking have been successful. Tobacco, the tobacco industry in the United States and Canada have, have been severely restricted. There are rules in place that they cannot just openly advertise and they cannot op advertise to children. This is not the case for a lot of the rest of the world. Tobacco use is reaching an epidemic level. It's just because we don't see it happening in our backyard doesn't mean that the tobacco industries aren't doing it elsewhere. And it's the same corporations that existed right here in North America. Again, they're spreading the, the poison that goes along with tobacco. So, that's what's going to happen in today's show. And first up, we're going to be listening to Dr. Etienne and her team from PAHO talk about what is happening in South America and the Caribbean as far as COVID-19. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us on today's press briefing by the Pan American Health Organization on the COVID pandemic in the Americas. Today is Wednesday, 28th, July 2029, and I am Sebastián Nolel from the Communications Department of Bajo. We have already received your questions by email, and you will be able to ask questions live through the Q&A button. Please always include your name and medium when you send your questions. Also, we have simultaneous interpretation to English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish, and you can uh, choose your option on the button below. Dr. Carissa Etienne, director of the Pan American Health Organization, will talk about the status of epidemiolo epidemiology and vaccination disruptions. Dr. Etienne is accompanied today by Dr. Jarbas Barbosa, Assistant Director, Dr. Ciro Garte, Director of the Department of Health Emergencies, and Dr. Sylvain Aldegheri, Incident Manager for COVID-19, all from PAHO. Now, I would invite Dr. Etienne to share her remarks. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's press briefing. Over the last week, there were over 1.26 million COVID-19 cases and nearly 29,000 deaths reported in the Americas. COVID continues to have a devastating toll in our region with Argentina, Colombia, Cuba, Ecuador, and Paraguay among the countries reporting the world's highest weekly death rates. Cases have more than doubled in the United States over the last week, mainly among unvaccinated people. The Mexican states of Baja California Sur, Quintana Roo, and Yucatan are also reporting a rise in new infections. In Central America, cases are accelerating in Guatemala and they remain high in Panama. Meanwhile, in the Caribbean, Cuba is experiencing higher COVID infection and death rates than at any point in the pandemic, and all age groups are affected. In the last week, more than 7,000 minors and nearly 400 pregnant women have tested positive for COVID-19. Cases are decreasing among several South American countries Although hotspots have been reported, 
in Argentinian provinces bordering Bolivia and Chile, and among Colombia's Amazon region. As COVID continues to circulate, too many places have relaxed the public health and social measures that have proven so effective against this virus. And as people move more easily and mingle without precautions, COVID follows. At the same time, our region has yet to access the vaccines that it needs to keep our population safe. So far, just 16.6% of the population of Latin America and the Caribbean has been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. And while vaccination coverage is higher in countries like the United States, Chile, and Uruguay, it remains below 20% for more than half of the countries and territories in our region. As countries have dedicated resources, staff, and attention to their COVID-19 responses, many have been hard pressed to keep up other essential health services that people need. In a recent survey of health services in the region, 97% of participating countries and territories reported disruptions. 45% reported disruptions in at least half of their health services. These disruptions are having an inordinate impact on our first level of care. The first level of care is the foundation of our health systems. It is here where children go to for immunizations, where expectant mothers receive prenatal checkups, and where people living with chronic conditions receive their medications. It is also here where the most COVID-19 testing and contact tracing takes place. Disruptions at the first level of care have worsened over the course of this pandemic, and the consequences have been devastating, particularly for routine immunizations. More than 300,000 children, mostly in Brazil and Mexico, missed out on their routine immunizations last year, leaving them vulnerable to deadly yet preventable infections. We are seeing as well dangerous drops in measles vaccinations throughout our region. Coverage of the first dose of measles vaccines dropped by 10% in eight countries in the Americas, including Venezuela, Panama, and Brazil, and dropped by as much as 20% in Suriname. If we do not reverse these trends, we risk an avalanche of worsening health issues in the Americas. Soon, COVID-19 will not be the only health crisis demanding countries' attention. We therefore urge countries to ensure their COVID-19 responses do not leave other essential services, health services, like routine immunizations behind. These services are not optional, so countries must maintain them as they control COVID-19 outbreaks. PAHO has worked with governments across our region to help them adjust and rethink how essential care is delivered at the first level, and, and we are continuing to work daily with them. Many health systems, including in Chile and Peru, have embraced telemedicine and others have launched community outreach programs so patients can continue to be seen by providers from the comfort of their homes. As the demands on our health systems grow, countries must hire and train additional staff and ensure that every health worker has the tools and resources to safely offer care during a pandemic. Equally important is ensuring that healthcare workers are fairly compensated for their extraordinary efforts. Chile, for example, recently approved a pay bump to providers who have been so critical to the COVID-19 response. We know that the economic blowback of this pandemic 
is forcing countries to make difficult choices on where to prioritize spending. But we cannot afford to cut corners on health. Because make no mistake, sooner or later, countries will assume the costs. And, and that is why investing in the first level of care now is a smart choice so we can reverse trends that are more, more efficiently and equitably than if we wait for health crises to surface. As the adage goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This is also true for health. Prevention is much more affordable than treatment. So as countries debut new COVID funding or seek loans from financial institutions, they must see investments in the first level of care as an essential component of their COVID-19 responses. Countries must make care more accessible by reducing out-of-pocket costs because no one should have to choose between their health and providing for their families. Today, we commemorate World Hepatitis Day, and we are reminded that too many people still cannot access the essential services they need to live long and healthy lives. So as we continue to be challenged by COVID-19, we must ensure our responses do not widen the gap in access to health by ensuring that our health systems have the resources that they need to be resilient. By committing the necessary and overdue investments in our health systems, countries can safely respond to the pandemic and keep people healthy and protect them from a multitude of other diseases. Muchas gracias, Dr. Etienne. Vamos a pasar Thank you, ahora. Dr. Etienne. Now we are going to go to our question and answer session. The first question that we have is from Rosmeris Bernal, journalist from the uh, Prensa Latina Agency. She asks whether PAHO recommends vaccination against coronavirus in uh, pregnant women and uh, minors. She also wants to know whether there are minimum requirements uh, for these vaccine proposals against COVID-19 to immunize these two um, vulnerable population groups. Dr. Barbosa, thank you very much for your questions. Yes. The safety criteria for vaccines are the same for all age groups. Vaccines need to go through phase one, two, and three trial uh, um, cl clinical trials. The trial started with adults because adults are the ones with the highest risk for the disease. Some vaccines for COVID-19 have already undergone phase three studies for teenagers and even uh, some authorization was um, requested and received. So uh, some vaccines have received the EUL for pregnant women we cannot run clinical trials in pregnant women. Uh, vaccines are evaluation, and there is no live virus vaccine for COVID-19 and in general. So this means that vaccines are safe also for pregnant women. What happens many times is when you begin to vaccinate women in the general population, if some of these women were pregnant and they were not aware that they were pregnant, then uh, these data are then assessed to confirm the safety in pregnant women. For the vaccination strategy, we have two different groups. Pregnant women who have some risk factors need to be part of the vaccination priorities because it has been confirmed that maternal mortality has grown due to complications of COVID-19. So we always need to do 
uh, assessment of uh, pregnant women who have other conditions, for example, if it's related to their work, uh, pregnant women who are nurses or physicians working in hospitals who are in contact with COVID patients, or pregnant women who suffer from hypertension or diabetes or, or, or who are obese, then we need to assess them. And if they have a risk, uh, then they need to be vaccinated. Adolescents are not a priority group. Adolescents should be considered after all the adults have been vaccinated. The first objective of the vaccine is to reduce deaths, to save lives, and teenagers need to go to a lower priority. Of course, the situation of vaccination in the different countries is different um, according to the countries. So when uh, um, uh, countries have vaccinated all their adults, they will start vaccinating uh, adolescents. Um, adolescents with some comorbidity should already have been included in the vaccination uh, schedules because if they have comorbidities, they could have serious, um, uh, serious complications after COVID. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Thank you very much for joining uh, today's ARIA meeting. Uh, we thought it would be useful uh, since this Sunday will mark six months since the Tatmadaw seized power in Myanmar. And what started as a political coup has now become a multifaceted crisis uh, with political, economic, health and humanitarian dimensions that I think everyone is well aware of. And the conflict has escalated. Uh, more than 5,000 people have been detained. I think colleagues will know too that the COVID situation is of particular concern. Uh, the coup has resulted in a near total collapse of the healthcare system and healthcare workers are being attacked and arrested. The virus is spreading uh, through the population very fast indeed. By some estimates, in the next two weeks, half of the population of Myanmar could be infected with COVID. Uh, so the situation is clearly very concerning. Colleagues will recall that we adopted Security Council Resolution 2565 in February, and that was conceived in part with crises like the one that Myanmar now faces in mind. So I think it's vital that we consider how to implement in Myanmar the call in Security Council Resolution 2565 for ceasefires to allow the distribution of vaccines and the delivery of essential humanitarian assistance. At the same time, of course, progress on the political track is more important than ever. We very much welcome ASEAN's work to support a solution and the ASEAN five-point consensus could represent an important foundation, but as we know, uh, implementation has been slow. So we call again for the Tatmadaw to take their commitment seriously, and we'll continue to consider all options available to the Security Council to encourage progress. So today's meeting, follows our previous ARIA formula meeting in April and is a further opportunity to hear from voices within Myanmar on the challenges facing the country and the prospects for resolving the crisis. As the military continues to try to silence the people of Myanmar, the international community wants to hear them speak and it is essential that they have a voice in our discussion at the UN and in the Security Council. The UK continues to stand with the people of Myanmar in their fight for democracy and in calling 
for an end to the coup. And I'd like to thank in advance all of our briefers for joining us today. I'm going to start by giving the floor to our two briefers. We may have some internet connections and we will do our best to work around them to ensure a smooth event. And then I will invite uh, council members and others who wish to speak to do so. So I'm going to start by giving the floor to Susanna Plata So, the National Unity Government's spokesperson for women, youth and children's affairs to discuss the challenges facing Myanmar and the National Unity Government's vision for a federal democracy. Uh, and if Susanna's internet connection fails, we have got a pre-recorded version of her statement if necessary, but uh, over to you, Susanna, thank you. Okay. Uh, Susanna, you're on mute still. Susanna, you're on mute. Excellencies, as a representative of National Unity Government and the people of Myanmar, thank you for allowing me to brief the Security Council and the ASEAN member states represented in today's area meeting. Six months have passed since the military stolen our people's sense of security and freedom and denied us to live in a safe and secure environment amidst the global pandemic. The camera of brutal and violent crackdown continue across those expressing their aspiration for federal democracy and rejection of gender's rule. Since February 1, the military has already killed over 900 civilians during protests and interrogations after being illegally detained. It is crucial to mention that out of those killed, over 17% are young women. Thousands are still in detention, facing torture and threats of COVID-19. The number of internally displaced people across the country continue to rise. Food insecurity growing. The economy is collapsing and the health system has collapsed. With a new wave of COVID-19 spreading like wildfire across the country, it is unfortunate that more lives will be lost as the military weaponized COVID-19 against the people. Excellencies, the coup has failed. And it's crucial to recognize that Tamaroy has led us to this political instability and public health emergency. We have lost innocent lives, damaged properties, and opportunities for our people. After 70 years of military rule at Khan Point, the people of Myanmar are determined to change the course of history and fight for democracy. Pro-democracy and anti-gender movements persist despite the continuous atrocities of the Tamadol in the last six months. The CSO, women organizations, CDM, and different ethnic groups remain committed to working with NUG, not with Tamadol State Administration Council. The National Unity Government, NUG, emerged from the massive protests against the coup that have involved almost every element of the Myanmar society. The NUG is consists of elected officials who manage to avoid arrest, ethnic representatives, and prominent members of protest movements. Thus, the NUG draws its legitimacy not only from the fact that it is composed of duly elected public officials, but also from the people's support. It is the closest entity that country currently has to a legitimate representative body embodying the people's will. The NUG is the most representative governing body ever formed in Myanmar. This refers not only to its diversity in age, ethnicity, gender, and religion, but also its commitment to safeguarding human rights for those groups that have 
historically have been marginalized. For the first time, the NUG has established Ministry of Human Rights and Ministry of Women, Youth and Children Affairs. The NUG cabinet members have reaffirmed their commitment to the rights of all ethnic minority groups, including Rohingyas, referring to them for the first time in official communication as citizens. The NUG has also vowed to abolish the 1982 citizenship law, which formed a basis for excluding the Rohingyas and stripping off their identity and rights as citizens of Myanmar. Furthermore, the NUG agrees to comply with any future rulings from International Court of Justice, ICG. Given the country's history of ethnic strife since its founding in 1948, the international community should acknowledge the NUG remarkable achievement in adopting such an gender position. As a Union Minister for Women, Youth and Children Affairs, allow me to share how the group impact women, youth and children and ministry initiative to perform its mandate despite the limitations. MOWYC received many complaints and reports of gender-based violence and sexual violence committed by SAC forced to illegally detain women and girls. The ministry condemned the hearing section on April 25th with women detaining survivors, relatives and friends. The stories were heartbreaking. Activist women and girls were raped at detention center by SAC security force. Military constitute crimes against humanity. Thus, the perpetrators of the atrocities must be held accountable. accountable. Currently, the MOWIC directly linked with UNSG Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict an independent investigative mechanism for Myanmar, double I double to ensure such cases are reported and documented. MOWYC is also organizing the CDM working under the ministry in different areas of Myanmar. For the time being, one deputy director is serving at, as in charge of Children Affairs Department, while 570 CDMers are working with MOWYC to support pregnant women, youth, and children, especially those detained and providing maternal kids and medicines. Now, let me draw your attention to the search of COVID-19 as the infection rate in the country is spiraling out of control. While the military council reported 6,000 positive cases and 400 deaths due to the COVID-19, it is undeniable that this is just the tip of iceberg due to the lack of system magic data collection process and the absence of a working system and mechanisms to prevent the spread of the virus. There is also growing evidence that the military council is purposely targeting the healthcare workers. Myanmar is now one of the most dangerous places for healthcare professionals, with more than 250 attacks on frontline workers and medical staff documented this year. Last week, Myanmar's military arrested several doctors treating COVID-19 patients independently. The NUG is doing our best towards a people center COVID-19 response to ensure equitable access to vaccination and PPEs for all people of Myanmar. We have developed a national deployment vaccination plan in accordance with the guidance of the WHO and UNICEF. Since its formation on April 16, the NUG has called for recognition from the international international community as the only legal and legitimate government of Myanmar. In practical terms, Recognition would grant the NUG much needed resources to be able to respond to the needs of our people. Myanmar is at critical point. With each passing day that the international community fails to take decisive action to recognize NUG, 
Myanmar moves closer to becoming a failed state, considering the deteriorating economy and humanitarian condition or the volume number of COVID-19 cases amid a collapsing healthcare system. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, recently warned that the country could plunge into all-out civil war if nothing is done. We urgently need the international community to do all necessary things to prevent further loss of lives due to the atrocity of the military gender and COVID-19. We urgently need political will, leadership, and most important, action from the international community so we can bring Myanmar back to democracy and bring about stability for our people and for our neighbors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Susanna, for your briefing, setting out so clearly uh, the critical situation, but also the important role for the international community. I'm going to pass the floor now to Gum Song Ang, the Secretary General of the Kachin Political Interim Coordination Team, who will also talk about the challenges facing the country, as well as the ethnic dimension of the crisis. Over to you. Madam Chair, Member of Security Council, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for today. It is my great honor to address in this Rio Formula meeting of the UN Security Council situation in Burma, especially as it marks the first for an ethnic Kachin to brief this council in 76 years since its founding. And we look forward to broader engagement with member states in the future. I would like to share our perspective as the spokesperson for Kachin political interim coordination team, KPEC, as Burma stands on the verge of state collapse posing major humanitarian and health risks to international peace and security. Before I address the prevailing challenges in our country, I'd like to offer my deepest condolences to the families of 6,133 victims and counting who lost their lives to COVID and to the families of 934 civilians who were killed by the military in the past six months and thousands who died during civil war and genocide campaigns against Rohingya Words cannot describe your pain and agony, but you'll always remember in our thoughts and prayers. In recent days, our social media feeds have been flooded with funeral service announcement and prayer, re- a prayer requests for swift recovery. As people suffering from COVID battles to gain access to oxygen and medicine, the deceased are unable to rest in peace. As incinerators are in major crematoriums are incapacitated due to the surging death tolls. We honor all health workers who risked your life serving COVID victims. You will, we will never forget the 5,370 prisoners of our conscience who are unlawfully detained by an illegal regime. Your bravery will forever be edged in the hearts of your fellow countrymen. Your excellencies, I'd like to now introduce to you about the Kachin people and the challenges we are facing. We are a population of over a million who lives in Burma's northern frontier foothill of the Himalayas, home to the Imperial Jade and land of the highest peak in Southeast Asia. We call half of the world's population our neighbors. Kachin is not is the only state in the union which shares border both with China and India. We're known as Singpo in India and Jingpo Su in Yunnan, China. In 1947, Kachin along with other ethnic groups co-founded this union of Burma, predicated upon the principle of equality and self-determination After a decade of abnegation of these principles, the Kachin began armed resistance against the Burmese government in 1961. 33 years later, and after numerous failed attempts, a formal ceasefire agreement was signed in 1994 between KIO-KIA and ruling junta called State Law and Auto Restoration Council. This agreement was forged during the period of repressive campaign against pro-democracy movement. In 1990, Hunter held a general election only to overthrow the result after the NLD had won a landslide victory. This assault on on democracy was followed 
by throwing activists and elected member of parliament into prison and labor camp across Burma. On June 9, 2011, civil war resumed in Gachin region, and since then, residents of Gachin state and northern Shan state have been brutally raped, ruthlessly murdered, and extrajudicially executed by the military. Under the moniker of democratic transition and national reconciliation with pro-democracy forces, the Burma army evaded serious international responses for war crimes, crime against humanity, and genocide in this very 21st century. In Gachin state, over 130,000 civilians have been forcibly displaced due to the fighting. As the military consolidated its grip on power, there has been wholesale land confiscation, racketeering, plundering of natural resources, and destruction of pristine forests on an industrial scale. According to the Global Witness, in 2014 alone, Gachin Jade Mines generated a revenue of 31 billion US dollars. That's 10 times the United Nations budget for 2020. Yet 80, more than 80% of Gachin Hill residents still do not even have a proper bed to go to bed at night. By 2000, Burma had become the next net exporter of refugees and illicit drugs to its neighbor, burdening global community with financial obligations and embarrassing even to its staunchest allies. Today, history is repeating itself again. The third generation military chief and aspiring dictator doubled down on violence and bloodbath to wage an outcome similar to that of his predecessor, Nguyen and Tan Shui. Dear honorable members, since the advent of social media, quasi-democracy and nascent engagement with the international community, the minds of Burmese people have been forever changed. Six months of failed coup is a proof that voices of our younger generation, Gen Z, cannot be silenced by obscene violence and military might alone. Prodigious number of youth across Burma brave through bullets, rockets, and tear gas to demonstrate their desi genuine desire to be free. Thousands of security force personnel joined CDM movement despite the risk of court martial and death sentence. The exceptional level of women's participation and the leadership in this movement, people's movement, should be recognized and applauded. All of this should serve as a testament that at the end of the day, the Burmese people and the humanity will prevail. The February 1st coup has reaffirmed the people of Burma's understanding that this military does not serve in the interest of any ethnic group, any religious community, or even the very institution it claims to represent. Its principal purpose is to perpetuate the rule of unstable, irrational junta elites. Even during the best of days for Burma democracy, the, pe the Burma's people's ballot was considered just three quarter of a vote because one quarter was automatically reserved for the military. Your excellencies, it is important to note that if the, level, the current level of COVID mismanagement is kept unabated, Burma could turn, potentially turn into a petri dish for the next strain of deadly COVID virus. Our concerns are growing for the rising number of COVID cases in IDB camps. If past, our past serve any lessons, we should know that Burma lost over 138,000 precious lives due to cyclone August, due to mismanagement and recklessness of this very institution in May of 2008. At the current speed of Delta strain sp spread, if left unchecked, it could tax a heavy toll on global financial health and security. This coup has caused irreparable harm to the already embattled COVID economy in Burma. It is teetering on a meltdown. The World Bank estimate Burma's GDP to contract by a staggering 18% by fiscal year ending in September. The UNDP estimate 50% of the country's population to be living below the poverty line by 2022. That's double that of 2019. In an agriculture-based society, lack of support during the monsoon season will strike a deliberating blow to the harvesting season this autumn. This will, the new privacy law and cybersecurity law will chastise many IT businesses due to lack of compliance. This will, this will empower uncompetitive, uninnovative military-related enterprise to take control of the sector. 
threat of violence has been the singular factor slowing down the possibility of major bank run in the past months. But it is an unsustainable approach to mitigate sol insolvency. Additionally, the 23% currency depreciation against dollar will make that obligation much harder to meet. Large divestment by multinational corporation in recent weeks due to looming systemic risk will pay for additional exits, resulting in a ravaged economy. Amid these prevailing national challenges, KPIC was, was created in a series of meetings be between March 8 and 11, consisting of five domestic and diaspora for Kachin organizations. Its primary purpose is to coordinate Kachin's interim political goals, which are, one, to affirm the national sovereignty is derived from the people, two, to end authoritarianism and promulgate a genuine federal union, and three, to partner with like-minded domestic and international organizations that shares our political goals. Under these guiding principles, we forge a political alliance with CRPH, committee representing Bidangsu Lutda to swiftly implement our shared objective. Therefore, KPIC members now serve in the cabinet of the National Unity Government. I must admit that the Chin community has had rough patches with the NLD government in the past, but we're clear-eyed about the prospect of the collective future. The cost of division will only play into the hands of the repressive regime. Despite pain and suffering, despite sickness and disease, Despite hardship and terror, we see hope. We see what lies beyond this period. We, see, we can see light at the end of the tunnel. We see that February 1st coup had placed the nation onto fast track to national unity and national cohesion. As such, I call this period the crucible of hope. Solidarity within and across ethnic and religious community is at a sobering height. In Kachin State, the intertribal tensions, which we witnessed up till even before the coup, hardly exist now. There may be talks of complaints and issue in promulgating Federal Democratic Charter, NUCC, or the unity government. But one thing which is abundantly clear is that all stakeholders are seeking durable solution to decade-old grievances by offering open and frank discussions, sometimes even unabashedly. This is a positive step forward for our nation and also set as a reminder to the NLD that this fight is not just about restoring democracy. Democracy without equality is no democracy at all. The alternative to NUG is not the junta, which in its current iteration is self-titled self-administrative council. The mo this moment is the last chance for the nation to live up to the promises of, of its founding. We will no longer tolerate to return to the horror past of the military regime and relive the status quo of the former years. In conclusion, we like to express our sincere appreciation to the UN Security Council's steadfast concern for the people of Burma and echo the February 4th statement on about upholding democratic institutions. Moreover, while we consider ASEAN's five-point consensus to be a great step forward, the current health crisis demands immediate robust action. To that end, we urgently call upon the good offices of Secretary General to convene a meeting with key stakeholders, including China and ASEAN, to engage all concerned parties. International health crisis management team should be dispatched to work directly with communities to administer vaccine and humanitarian assistance cross-border aid is essential to control and mitigate the spread. And we also call upon the Security Council to impose an international arms embargo and no-fly zone along Myanmar's border with China, India, and Thailand to enhance the border security. And also to impose targeted sanction against SAC members and state-owned enterprise, including Myanmar oil and gas enterprise, which funds egregious human rights abuses and empower costly war and also to deny the military junta any recognition in the United Nations, and to ensure the accountability of crime of aggression against civilians by referring the situation of Myanmar to International Criminal Court. These are the most suitable arrangement to foster peace. The past 10 years of normalization efforts in Burma have proved to us that engagement alone will not deter the army from, mil 
from its campaign against its own people. We desire to send, see an end to the longest civil war in the world. But we are unable to do this alone. We're ready and committed to witness peace in this very generation. After all, it was largely thanks to the British, Americans, and then Chinese collaboration, which initiated from the Northeast India, which firstly liberated the Chin Hills and the rest of Burma. We plead your help again, and thank you. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Hello to everyone uh, from WHO headquarters here in Geneva. My name is uh, Tarik. Yes, Shagavich, and I welcome you to this uh, virtual press conference on the launch of the report on the global tobacco epidemic. Uh, this is the uh, eighth report in the series of Empower reports funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies. Uh, those journalists who have asked uh, to get embargoed uh, copy uh, had opportunity to go through the report in, in the previous days. Uh, today we will uh, discuss the key findings as well as uh, measures that are being taken to fight tobacco epidemic. The report as well as the press release uh, has been already posted so there is no embargo for this press briefing. With us today as announced in the media advisory, uh, we have Dr. Rudiger Krach, who is uh, our Director of the Department of Health Promotion here at WHO. Dr. Vinayak Prasad is the Unit Head, No Tobacco uh, Department of Health Promotion as well. And also with us is Dr. Kelly Henning, who is a Public Health Program Lead with Bloomberg Philanthropies. So we will start with the opening remarks, and then we will open the floor to questions. Those who, uh, journalists who would like to ask a question, please uh, click raise hand and uh, we will put you in the queue. So with this, uh, I'll give the floor uh, to Dr. Krach to, give, to tell us more about uh, where we are when it comes to uh, tobacco epidemic and what is being currently done to fight it. Dr. Krach. Thank you, Yannick. Um, good day to all of you uh, who join us today. We are at a time in history where we would uh, and could be easily distracted by the many novel and emerging products that have been propagated onto the market by the tobacco industry. But we need to stay focused on the goal now rooted in the Sustainable Development Goals to reduce tobacco use globally. Over 8 million people die annually from tobacco use and exposure to tobacco smoke. Tobacco is a leading cause of preventable deaths. Saving these lives has to be a priority. Millions of people live in poor health due to, to, to tobacco and many are unable to work and take care of their families. Tobacco use has been on a steady decrease. We should acknowledge this achievement, understand better what has worked to get this far and accelerate into the future. We never expected this to be easy. It will take time, but mostly det determination and commitment to beat the tobacco epidemic. And this is what countries have continued to demonstrate and is evidence from the results of this report. There are other challenges ahead. COVID-19 has brought with it new concerns. We know that smoking worsens the outcomes of COVID-19 infections and that tobacco use is closely associated uh, with the underlying conditions that make so many people more vulnerable to severe COVID-19 outcomes. Health systems have been challenged by the pandemic and services for non-communicable diseases disrupted. Going forward, tobacco's role in people's vulnerability will need to be embedded in our efforts to build back better and stronger. I thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kwasha. Now, uh, Dr. Prasad, if you would like to tell us more about the findings and key points of the report. Thank you, Tarek. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, colleagues. Um, <clears throat> since the last report that was in 2019, uh, the, this report looks at progress uh, and we have seen that more than 24 countries, 24 countries have actually made significant progress in policies at the highest level. Much of the gains have come from pictorial health warnings. Now we have more than 100 countries, 101 countries to be precise. More than 60% of the population now have that. Other policies have also moved forward, but tobacco taxation has been the slowest. There have been some policies which are seeing a, a reversal and the, the one which stands out is cessation services because of the COVID uh, pandemic last year. So this year's focus on World Tobacco Day was to see the scale up of cessation. The other policy which seen some downswing also is that some countries have reduced their tobacco taxes. We still have 49 countries which don't have any of these policies at the highest level. So there's a lot of work to be done and most of these countries are LMICs and LDCs, low income countries. This report's focus on electronic nicotine delivery devices, commonly known as e-cigarettes. What do we see? 56 countries monitor this. So the rest of the world doesn't monitor this. So we cannot have a global trend and we need the countries to start monitoring use of electronic nicotine delivery devices and non-nicotine delivery devices. On the policy front, what do we know? We have 32 countries that have banned use of electronic cigarettes. Now, it's a mixed number. Of the 32, 9 are high income countries, 18 middle income countries, and the rest low income countries. Then 79 countries partially regulate these products. And out of the 79, only 9 of them ban flavors. So we have 70 countries which do regulate like banning smoking of these products in public places or putting some advertising or graphic warning similar to tobacco, but 70 of them don't ban flavors and that's a problem. And then there's the remaining 84 countries which do nothing. So we have a whole free ground for the tobacco industry to target the most vulnerable, who? The children. So what are they doing? This report identifies some of the challenges. One, because children look at flavors, the countries that have not banned flavors or restricted them, the industry has made good inroads. What second we have found is that those children who are non-smokers, don't take tobacco, but go into e-cigarette e use, end up two to three times, almost three times like, more likely to become tobacco users when they grow up. That's a serious problem. And then sale, sale restrictions. So while 90% of the world has put restrictions on selling cigarettes to minors, only 40 2%, right, yeah, 42 percent of the of the countries have put any age restrictions so anybody can go and buy so that's again a problem and then what we are seeing is that more than two-thirds of or more than 70 percent of those who who are smokers shifting to electronic cigarettes they end up still using tobacco so they are dual users, they just switch partially. Again, that's more harmful. And so that's also a challenge which we are seeing. We also see that the quit options like cessation services, which we have, counseling, text message, they all work for e-cigarette users. So it's a good opportunity for all e-cigarette users to use any of these tools to quit. Do you remember, we are 1.3 billion tobacco users even now. So 1 billion of them are smokers and more than 300 million of them all into smokeless tobacco use. So the report shows progress, but we still have a major problem ahead. Thank you. Many thanks, um, 
Dr. Prasad, um, before I give the floor to uh, Dr. Henning, just to remind journalists that uh, if you wish to ask a question, please click uh, icon raise hand. We did uh, receive some uh, uh, questions uh, earlier by email. We may also try to address at some point. Uh, now I would uh, uh, ask Dr. Henning, uh, who is uh, Public Health Program Lead at uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies, to uh, tell us more about the role of Bloomberg and other partners in tobacco control, and maybe also have a few words on, uh, on the tobacco in industry interference and uh, how this can be dealt with. Dr. Henning. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you very much. First, I would like to extend my congratulations to WHO for producing this report in such a difficult year and on collecting brand new data on ENDS or electronic cigarettes, much of this data for the very first time. We are really proud to partner with WHO on tobacco control and on this report since 2007. When we speak about ENDS products or electronic cigarettes, I want to spend just a moment talking about the tobacco industry and their role, which is so intertwined with these products. For decades now, the industry has promoted new products, often claiming that the new products are less harmful. We saw this with filtered cigarettes. We saw this with low-tar cigarettes and even menthol cigarettes. And this, this is now another version of the new product dialogue. We know e-cigarettes are extremely appealing to children, and the industry's goal is to get a whole new generation of users addicted to these products. Tobacco and ENDS companies use sleek product designs. They promote through social media influencers and flavors, which attract kids to these products. In the United States, uh, 2011, the percent of high school students using e-cigarettes has increased from 1.5% to 19.6%. And even though we see some encouraging decreases in the last year or so, the prevalence of use among students is still very, very high. And the U.S. has not yet effectively addressed or regulated these products. Kids are attracted to flavors, with 85% 80, of U.S. kids using flavored products like fruit flavor or mint flavored. And we've seen major industry pushback against every effort to regulate flavored products in the U.S., despite evidence that kids are using these. The report documents tactics used by the industry to undermine Empower, the FCTC, and other tobacco control policies countries are working so hard to pass, using tactics like creating front groups and intense lobbying against policies. We have seen these tactics employed across the entire globe. Governments and other stakeholders have ways to counter industry tactics, and these are laid out in this report and are based on the FCTC. Some actions governments can take include requiring researchers to be transparent about their funding and their interaction with the industry treating state-owned tobacco like private tobacco companies, and making sure conflict of interest policies are in place so that policymakers working on tobacco control do not have clear industry ties. Some countries are already taking action to address these new products. 111 countries in total have some measure in place to address ends. But that means that 84 countries have no existing policies to regulate these products. Much more work is needed, and this data helps us guide the way forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Henning, uh, on these uh, opening remarks. Uh, now we will uh, start with questions uh, from uh, journalists who are online, and uh, we will start with uh, Jérémy Lange from uh, uh, Radio France Internationale. Jérémy. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I've got two questions. Uh, uh, the first one will be, what are the main marketing uh, strategies uh, that you would like to see banned? Uh, is it uh, the, the, the flavor issue that you just raised, for instance? You, you, would you like to see those flavors banned so as to prevent uh, children from using those products or uh, electronic cigarettes? And the second question is, uh, regarding uh, a comment by the head of Philip Morris just recently that he, he said that he would like to see a world without cigarettes as soon as possible. The question is simple. Do you believe 
such claims. Yeah, thank you very much for, for these two questions. Now, first of all, let us look into, into these flavors. There's about 16,000 flavors uh, currently for e-cigarettes, and bubble gum and vanilla ice cream, choco cookies, I th think they appear more, they appeal more to my grandchildren than to me. So if, um, if that is not regulated, and I think Dr. Prasad uh, and also Dr. Henning outlined very clearly how many countries have not yet regulated um, uh, the, the use of e-cigarettes, that means that kids can go and get e-cigarettes for these flavors. And we know that um, you are much more likely then to use cigarettes in the end. At least twice, if not three, three times more, the risk is there that you will then become a, a, a cigarette smoker. That calls for exactly the same regulation as cigarettes you have. So that's what, what we uh, advise countries to do and speed up um, because uh, as we speak new devices get on the market, new flavors get on the market. This is um, um, an issue that requires strict regulation. On um, uh, this um, news of um, a tobacco company saying that they would like to have um, to, to, uh, to, to stop uh, cigarettes uh, production, um, we usually don't comment on this, but let us be clear. If you have been part of the problem, or actually a big part of the problem, uh, of killing 8 million people, we have seen many tactics in the past, like light cigarettes, filter cigarettes, menthol cigarettes, that also claim to be the healthier alternative. The, while the evidence is not yet totally conclusive on the issue of e-cigarettes, we know that they are also harmful. So therefore, I don't believe uh, this time that um, um, all of a sudden you, you, you turn from being the real problem to being part of the solution. I don't, get, I don't buy that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kerr. Uh, uh, Dr. Henning, would you like to comment on this one? Would you like to add something? I agree with uh, with the comments by Dr. Craig. I would also say that, you know, just to be clear, we do believe that flavored uh, e-cigarettes should be banned. Um, tobacco flavor e-cigarettes exist, but the goals in the U.S. right now and it's are to ban all flavors because as was outlined, these flavors are extremely appealing to kids and 85% of e-cigarettes used by kids in the U.S. are flavored. So yes, we agree, we agree with that point. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Henning. Uh, let's go to Jakarta Post uh, in Indonesia. We have with us uh, Rifki Ramadan. Rifki, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. I have two questions as well. Firstly, what should countries with several high compliance in several aspects of empower, but low or lack of compliance in several other aspects of empower do? My second question would be, what should a country do where there, where there is no regulations or on ENDS? However, the use of such device has, been, has become very prevalent in such countries. Thank you. Thank you, Rifki. Maybe Dr. Prasad will start. Thank you um, <clears throat> for your question. So there are two aspects to it, moving policies and then getting into implementation and compliance. So there are a number of countries that have moved their policies in the right direction, but then they don't have the resources or the infrastructure in place to improve uh, compliance and implementation and that's what we are seeing in a number of countries. So to answer your question, those countries which have low compliance but have already got their policies in, 
it's not a question of political will. The will is already there. The policies have moved. But then we need to get uh, to support the um, the implementation. So it requires community participation, but it also requires governments to invest in setting up national tobacco control programs, multi-sectoral coordination mechanisms, because it's a whole of government approach, which is the only way to move forward. Because raising taxes will require finance ministry. Looking at livelihood will require a labor ministry and agriculture ministry. So that's that's an important part. The countries which are on low compliance and have no resources, no policies, we need to create policy coherence. And coming from Jakarta, Indonesia is a good example where we need to create policy coherence amongst all stakeholders, not just the health ministry, but other ministries in Jakarta, in, in, in Indonesia to move the policies. Because Indonesia is still one of the highest burden countries in the world. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Prasad. Um, let's uh, move to next uh, question. We have uh, uh, Agence France Press and Robin Miller with us. Robin? Thank you for uh, taking my question. Uh, simply put, how would you describe people who target an addictive, harmful product to children that kills 8 million people a year? Thank you. I would say criminal. It's the most criminal act and it's a human rights violation. So to those who are targeting children, irrespective of who they are, especially with toxic and poisonous products, it's a criminal action and it's important to take note of. The Framework Convention recognizes that on tobacco we cannot take chances, especially with children because their brain development gets impacted they run the risk of being addictive for the rest of their lives. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. Mm. Dr. Henning, would you like to comment on this? I think Dr. Prasad summed it up very well. I, I would agree with him completely. I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Thank you. And indeed, uh, it's, it's time to call these things by their name. Um, we will now call on Stephanie Nebehey from Reuters. Stephanie. Thank you, Tarek. Um, uh, I recall that this um, framework convention um, that was negotiated here many years ago, I recall that neither the US nor Switzerland nor some of the other countries that are home to big tobacco have ever ratified the treaty. Um, is that hopeless and how does it affect uh, your efforts to get regulation of tobacco and e-cigarettes in particular in this instance? Thank you. Today and thank you for supporting us with our sponsors. Please go to depictions.media for more information and click on our contact link and let us know how we can help, how we can help bring your story and help bring us to a better world. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.